Hey guys, it's Cece and today I am here to talk about all of the books that I read in the month of June. And May. So I'm a little late in doing my wrap up, but I'm here. I'm here to wrap things up. In June, I had this big plan that I was going to read 30 books in 30 days. That didn't happen, but I did read 15 books in 30 days, which I'm still saying is really good for me. Like, I am not displeased with that number, it's just that I'm hard on myself when I want to accomplish a task and I don't. However, 15 books is amazing. All 15 of those books had a queer protagonist, and I also never did a May wrap-up, so I have two books to talk about that I read in May, one of which is queer. So I only have one book on this list that I'm going to talk about that doesn't feature a queer main character. Let's consider this a very gay wrap-up overall. I participated in three readathons, I guess, over the course of both of these months. In May, I was participating in the Asian readathon. I wound up reading two books for that. It was a month long. Um, and in June, I participated in two, the Queer Lit Readathon, which I don't have a vlog for up yet, and the Queer Blackathon, which I do have a vlog up for. So without any further intro, let's go ahead and jump in because I have 17 books to talk about. 17 books to wrap up. We are going to start with my least favorite and work up to my most favorite for these two months. Let's get going. So unfortunately, my least favorite book that I read through both of these months was The Love and Lies of Roxana Ali by Sabina Khan. I have been really excited about this book and maybe that's why I feel so let down by it, just because it's been so hyped. It was released in 2019 and like I've wanted to read it so badly, so maybe it's just that I was distraught that it wasn't what I wanted it to be. This is about a 17 year old girl named Roxana and she is not out to her parents, but she has a girlfriend who she loves a lot. And then one day her parents catch her making out with her girlfriend. And so she is sent to Bangladesh where she's very much thrust into these arranged marriages and being super traditional for her very traditionally Muslim parents and extended family. So I don't know how to talk about this book without talking about spoilers. Um, okay, there's one thing I can talk about that's not spoilers that I think is super important, and that is that the girlfriend in this book is fucking terrible. Awful. She is so completely full of herself, so completely demented to believe that the horrific torture that her girlfriend is going through doesn't compare to how sad she is about how uh, Roxana can't be out right now, which is the most infuriating concept. And here's the thing, here's what it comes down to with this book. It feels like it was written by a straight person for other straight people. And I... Uh, I hate it. I hate books like that. The author of this book has a daughter who is in the LGBT community and she wanted to be able to write a book for her daughter, but this is full of like every trope imaginable for cishet people being the worst that they could possibly be and still somehow feeling like they deserve forgiveness. And not only feeling like they deserve forgiveness, but getting forgiveness. Like this is just one big giant apology squad for how straight people can be evil and torture queer people and then ultimately be forgiven. And it's bullshit and I'm mad about it. I know this isn't the positive way to start off this wrap up, but I was really frustrated with the idea of young queer people in high school reading this book because I think not only does it set up, okay, if your parents find out you're going to be queer, you're going to be whisked off to a foreign country and forced into an arranged marriage. Horrifying. But you know, at least if there was a message behind that, I could get behind it. But ultimately, the message seems to be straight people are bad and horrible, but eventually they'll understand and it's our job as queer people to forgive them. So I... I don't want to give this one star, but I, I was infuriated reading this book infuriated because not a single person provided what Roxana needed at any point. And there's a really unforgivable method used to make the parents realize how fucking terrible they are and it is not okay either. Here, I'll put spoilers across my face. Spoilers for the end of The Love and Lies of Roxana Ali. Basically, in order for her parents to forgive Roxana for being a lesbian, one of Roxana's friends who is gay has to be killed. He, he is murdered in a gay bashing and that is how uh, Roxana's parents are like, you know, maybe we should apologize for the torture. No. Okay, uh, so I promise from here on out things will be slightly more positive. 
that book just infuriated me. <laughs> so the next one I want to talk about is Mean Little Deaf Queer by Terry Galloway. I read this during the Queer Lit Readathon, and it is nonfiction. It's a memoir about Terry Galloway growing up in Texas or she grew up a bit in Berlin, Germany, and then moved to Texas. For some stuff, this is fascinating. For other stuff, this doesn't work. So the things that I found fascinating were the discussions of big D deaf culture versus little d deaf culture, and how Terry feels she fits into one or the other, and the different treatments they're in. Like, there's a bunch in here about disability and what it means to Terry and what it means to a community, and I thought that that was all excellent. The thing that I don't think works about this book is that it reads like an old cowboy memoir. Like, this book didn't feel like it was set in the 20th century. It felt like I was reading about a cowboy from the 1800s. And I think it comes from the fact that Terry has a real passion for memoirs. She talks about it a lot in the intro of the book, that she loves memoir as a method of storytelling. And I think it just comes across as very old-fashioned, which isn't necessarily a mark against it. It just makes it feel unbelievably dry for my own personal reading experiences. So I was interested in Terry's life and what she went through, but I think that the writing style was weak overall. Ultimately, I gave this three out of five stars. I would still recommend it if you want to learn like a little bit more about deaf culture and if you are interested in like messy queer people who are vicious and like Terry isn't necessarily a likable person. And I think that there is a power in representing yourself as someone who isn't nice and in, in representing the sides of yourself that aren't societally acceptable. I think there's a power in that, which is the other reason I would recommend this. I don't know. I'm divided. Next we have a poetry collection, Goddess of the Hunt by Shelby Eileen. This is an arrow ace retelling sort of about Artemis, the Greek goddess, and it's good. I, I like Shelby Eileen. I read their poetry collection Soft in the Middle a couple of months ago and I really loved it and I think I was expecting to love this as much as I loved that and I just didn't. There are some parts of this collection that work super well and those are the bits of poetry from Artemis's perspective as she's working through her own arrow ace identity, as she is experiencing acceptance or ridicule. That's all good. There are these poems that happen in between every poem. They act as descriptions of gods and goddesses. They're very abstract, and I didn't fully understand them or their value as part of the collection. I felt like every time I would read a poem that I really loved, then I would get to another page that was a description of a goddess that was very abstract and that I didn't get, and it threw off my rhythm while I was reading this collection. So I loved the Arrow A stuff. It was very good. And I loved the stuff about Artemis and her mom and some of the other goddesses that Artemis learns from, but it was uneven as a poetry collection. So I wound up giving this 3.5 out of 5 stars. Still going to continue reading some more Shelby poetry. Eileen, I have a bunch more. This was good. It wasn't great. I also read a super, super short book called The Queen of Cups by Ren Basil. This is about 25 pages long. It's basically a short story. Maybe you could call it a novelette. This has a non-binary autistic main character. I believe it's also possible they are arrow or ace, like and or ace. And much like all of their siblings that came before, the main character of this story is going to go and visit the Oracle and hear about their future. This is a super inclusive and lovely little fantasy story. The only thing that I wanted of it was more. It's only 25 pages long and I would have loved to read more, but I loved this super inclusive, diverse world. The main character is not the only one who is queer, not the only one who's trans, not the only one who's neurodivergent, and that's what I strive for, that's what I look for, is stories where there is a vast collection of queer characters who all get to be together and have these different stories. The magic was great, it was just not nearly long enough. I wound up giving this 3.5 out of 5 stars. I really suggest that you pick it up though. I think it's a delightful little story to read, a delightfully inclusive and uplifting tale of ships and adventures and magic and acceptance. Okay, moving on, let's talk about Meet Cute Club by Jack Harbin. I talked about this book in my 10 and 10 video about queer adults. It is a romance book about a guy named Jordan who loves romance. He loves romance as a genre, and he actually hosts his own romance book club, the Meet Cute Club, which is kind of failing. 
people keep leaving and it's making Jordan really self-conscious about the fact that people don't want to be seen reading romance books. And on top of that, there is a new employee at his favorite bookstore who keeps making fun of him for reading, like, grandma novels. Until that guy starts showing up at the Meet Cute Club and starts showing a genuine investment in romance and possibly in Jordan. So this has a queer black main character and a male male romance. It is delightfully sweet. I've heard from people who read a lot of romance books, like specifically Chelsea from Chelsea Dowling Reads, that Jack Harbin's other books are really excellent as well, so I might have to check them out. I would say that this is definitely a romance book to read if you're looking for sweet content. It's adorable. I don't know that I would necessarily verge into saying it was sexy, it's more just like a sweet romance. And I wound up giving that 3.5 out of 5 stars as well. Next, I have another romance book. This one is an FF romance, and that is Something to Talk About by Meryl Wilsner. This is about a Hollywood star and this Hollywood star's assistant. So we have Joe and Emma. Joe has been in Hollywood for years. She's been acting for years. Her assistant Emma is relatively new, but they've gotten to know each other fairly well. And at the beginning of this book, Joe does not want to go to this award show alone, so she asks her assistant Emma to come with her. But then they are captured on film, making one another smile, looking at each other like they are the only two in the world. And so rumors start to fly that the two of them are involved with one another. So we have a Chinese American lesbian main character in Joe and a Jewish bisexual main character in Emma. Emma also has asthma and is actually kind of a significant part of the book that she has asthma. I think ultimately this was cute. I really like stories about famous people about Hollywood. I just like the glitz and glam of like going to award shows and being on movie sets. That kind of thing has always interested me, so I think that this book appealed to me more than it appealed to some other people because of those aspects, but it is the slowest burn. It takes forever to get anywhere in this book, and I respect that many people are not going to like this because of it. There are a lot of times when you read this and you're like, nothing is happening. Talk to each other, please. And those were the times that I was like, annoyed reading this, but I did love the relationship enough and love the setting enough that I wound up giving this 3.5 out of 5 stars. I thought it was fun. A lot of other reviewers that I follow have not been super enthusiastic about this, and I respect that. I just, I love a good Hollywood romance. <laughs> Next up, we have Princess Princess Ever After by Katie O'Neill. I was so excited to finally read this book. I have read Katie O'Neill's Dragon Society books, uh, Tea Dragon Society books, and I've been really wanting to read this. I'd seen um, most of it before because this blew up kind of as a webcomic originally and everyone on Tumblr kind of lost their minds over it. This is about a girl who is in a tower who is waiting to be rescued by a prince and a princess shows up instead and rescues her. It's a really sweet book. I thought it was adorable. I do want to warn you that there's some fat phobia. Uh, there is an antagonist in the book who calls one of the princesses some really horrible names uh, related to her weight. I didn't know that going in, and I know that if that was something that was going to upset me, I would have wanted to know going in, so please be aware of that, but know that it's always framed as a terrible bad thing. It's just kind of nasty. Um, but the romance was sweet. This was a sweeping fantasy. It was something that I, like, would love to read too a child. I would love for this to be a children's storybook that I could read. So I'm gonna keep it forever for that purpose, and also because I think it's sweet. I give it four stars. More poetry. Next we have The Tradition by Jericho Brown. This is a poetry collection about how we've become accustomed to terror, um, and it kind of maps that terror through an exploration of the body and the self. The most remarkable thing, I think, about this poetry collection is it invents a new form called the duplex. Jericho Brown invented it, and I really like it as a form of poetry. It's something where it makes you constantly question the line you've just read, and you're always reframing the poem as you read it. Just like every line is a play on the line before it in a very particular way that I found fascinating. This is also very much about queer black identity and what that means to Jericho Brown, what that means as a place in society. I found it a little complex, a little over my head in a lot of places, so it's another poetry collection I'm going to want to get into more so that I can understand more of the poetry, but I did love what I read and I loved 
all of the duplex poems. They were such interesting parts of this collection. This has won many, many awards. It's a genuinely beautiful poetry collection, and I think maybe a uh, rating could go up higher in the future, but for now I'm gonna give it four out of five stars. Next up we have The Prince and the Dressmaker by Jen Wang. This is a graphic novel. It's about a prince, Prince Sebastian, and Francis, who is a dressmaker, and Francis is hired to create dresses for Sebastian because his secret is that he likes to wear dresses, he likes to put on makeup, and through their relationship, through developing gowns, Sebastian starts being able to go out and explore the nightlife as this alternate persona. I will say this is a very cute graphic novel, and a lot of people have rated this super highly, and I totally understand. I love the idea of queer people and their stories in other time periods. I've talked about it tons in other videos that I'm fascinated by queer historical fiction, but I don't think enough people talk about this book and how upsetting it can be, and I think that that is something that people should go into reviews being a lot more willing to talk about. A character of this book is outed in a brutal, horrifying, and public way. If you were warned about that, then that is good. If you aren't warned about that, it can be an extremely emotional and upsetting experience. Feel good reads, yes, please keep recommending books that you think make you feel good, but if you're ever going to put this on a list of things that make you happy, please, please let your queer viewers know, especially that a character is outed and it is difficult because you have to go in prepared. I loved the art style of this. I thought it was beautiful. I loved the way that the dresses looked. It's really a sweet story. I did give it four out of five stars and I did go into it knowing about the more difficult aspects of the storylines and I'm glad that I did. I would say it's great. The uh, identity of Sebastian is never really fully put on the page. The author has said that you can kind of have a genderqueer lens on the story, that that's kind of the direction that she was taking with it. I do think it's sweet. I just... I know that I've added this caveat a lot of times, I just think it's really important. Next up I wanted to talk about Otherbound by Corinne Divis. This is a fantasy book about people who share minds. So this follows Amara and Nolan. Nolan is part of our world. He lives in, I want to say Arizona. Yeah, Arizona. But every time he closes his eyes, every time he so much as blinks, he sees the world from Amara's perspective. Amara lives in a fantasy world. She is protecting a princess from a curse. She's also been pretty brutalized and terrorized throughout her life. Both Amara and Nolan are people of color and both are disabled. Nolan is missing a part of his leg. He also has seizures. They're sort of magical seizures. Um, and then Amara she does not have a tongue, she speaks with sign language. I think that this was really fascinating because it explored this element of mind sharing as invasion, which is not something I've seen as much in mind sharing stories. I'm a really big fan of characters sharing a brain space, that's another trope I've talked about a lot as something that I'm drawn to, and that's why I wanted to read this because the premise sounded a lot like Sense8, but this explored so much more deeply the idea of invasion and privacy and I was really fascinated by that. Um, Amara is also bisexual, and there is a whole storyline about that, but this is just like, this is a really dark fantasy. It takes a while to get started, but it is extremely dark. The stakes are extremely high for these two characters, and I loved the world building of our world and this fantasy world, and how they interact and why they interact. I like Corinne Doivis a lot. I read her book On the Edge of Gone, which has an own voices autistic protagonist. I'm really excited about her upcoming book, um, which is going to have a queer protagonist. If you're unaware, Corinne Doivis is actually the creator of the term own voices. She is the one who created that, especially for disability rep in particular. I have been invested in supporting her, reading more of her books, and I'm so glad that I picked up Otherbound next because it was brilliant. These like fantasy sci-fi books, so, so good. I wound up giving this four out of five stars. I can't wait to read. I think it's called The Art of Saving the World. I think Corinne might be one of my new favorite authors. Maybe. Next we have a short story collection, and that is Close to Spider-Man by Ivan E. Coyote. This 
is another book that I talked about in my 10 in 10 video. This is a collection of short stories about queer women living in the Yukon. If you want to read detailed reviews of every single story in this collection, I'm going to link my Goodreads review down in the description below. I always write detailed notes for every short story collection that I read, and I will describe a bit more in detail why I love this book as, as much as I do. I think the biggest thing is that every single story in this collection has value. I liked every story in the collection. I got the point of every story in the collection. Despite the fact that some of them are quite short, this is a pretty small selection, but it's immediately made me want to read more of Ivan E. Coyote's work. I have their memoir, Tomboy Survival Guide, that hopefully I'll be able to read soon. This goes through so many different elements of queer identity, as well as exploring this intense landscape of the Yukon. That It's beautiful, but it's also difficult, it's lonely, and what that means for queer women in this area, I love it. I haven't read a ton of, like, queer Canadian fiction, even though so much queer fiction comes out of Canada, so I'll definitely have to work on that more as well. I gave this 4.5 out of 5 stars overall. Oof, we are getting to the end of this video, I promise, but next I have to talk about the only book on this list that doesn't have a queer main character, and that is The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. I read this in May, I listened to it. My mom got married in May and I didn't want to fly because that is super unsafe right now considering COVID, but I did really want to be able to be there for my mom to get married. So I drove for 13 hours all the way there and all the way back <laughs> just to see her get married. And while I was driving, I listened to The Poppy War. This is a high fantasy an adult high fantasy book. It is the beginning of a trilogy. It's about a girl named Rin, who is from the poorest province in the world, basically, and her only chance to get out is to take this extremely difficult test so that she can go to a university. Despite the fact that she is uneducated, poor, beaten down by her adoptive parents, she's a war orphan who is taken in. Somehow, she not only takes this test, but she beats everyone else in her province and she gets a spot at the most prestigious university in the world. And a lot of this book is about school. A lot of this book is set at a weird school for combat. And for a while, it seems like that part of the book is never going to end, but it does, and then it gets dark as fuck. Not that the stuff at school isn't dark, but... Oh my god. There's been a lot of discussion about the fact that a bunch of people will shelve this as YA because it has a teenage protagonist, so I'm gonna emphasize along with uh, most other people in saying that that is absolutely not true. This is not YA in any sense of what it means to be a YA book. Not that there's anything wrong with being a YA book, but this book should not go to 13 year olds ever. It's one of the most triggering and dark books that I've ever read, particularly in the last half. I'm going to include a rough list of triggers in the description below. It's a long list and most of it happens in one chapter. It's ex extremely upsetting. <laughs> now that I've done all of that prefacing, I want to say that I fucking loved this. Unsurprisingly, because we're at the top end of the selection of books that I've read. I've been talking about a bunch of four and a half star books. This is a four and a half star book, so you know I loved it. And I think it's because it did so many things well that I normally don't like. There's like a... there's a fantastical element to this book. Basically, the more that Rin is at school, the more she learns about something called shamanism, um, and that is a significant part of the story. And it's very much about soldiers and battles, and I don't find battles particularly engaging when I'm reading about them, or even watching them. Like, those big, widespread battles, I just kind of, like, my eyes glaze over. And I value this book so much because it made me so emotional about every battle. It gave me such an emotional center to focus on every time there was a huge conflict. And I love this book because it is about someone who makes bad decision after bad decision, and I fucking love it. Rin makes horrible decisions. She is fantastic. Like, moral ambiguity or a descent into making really horrific decisions is something that I'm so invested in, and this book did it perfectly. I cannot wait to read the rest of this series. Oh my god. So, my only issue with this book is that I thought that the bit at school took too long. However, 
I know how much value all of that time had in terms of carving out characters so that you could have value later in their relationships. Maybe if I had read this physically, my opinion would have been different, but listening to it, it just felt like that bit took a very long time. So I gave this four and a half out of five stars. I loved it. I can't wait to read more. It was so good. But please, please do not consider this YA. Don't do that. <laughs> the last book that I have on this list that is a four and a half star book from here on out. After this, it'll be five star. Uh, last four and a half star we have is This Is What It Feels Like by Rebecca Barrow. This is a YA contemporary about three girls who used to be the closest of friends and they had a band together and then a bunch of stuff happened and they stopped playing music. We have one girl, Hannah, who is an alcoholic and she had to go into a treatment center for alcoholism. We have Dia, who is a teen mom. And we have Jules, who is a lesbian. Uh, Dia, I believe, is Latinx and Jules is black. Hannah is white. So that is all of that. But the alcoholism and the baby kind of broke up the band and then it turns out that this annual competition, this battle of the bands, has an incredible cash prize this year. And so the three of them have to start deciding if they want to get over their differences come together again and become a band again. I think I talked about this in my Goodreads review, but the thing that I find remarkable about this book is that it is sad. There are so many elements of it that are tragic, but every word of this is infused with joy. It brought me so much joy because it's about girls growing and learning together and maybe becoming friends again and getting over differences and falling in love. There are multiple love stories. There are family relationships, friend relationships, romantic relationships, and there's this love of music and this passion that these three girls have for being in a band together. And I love girl bands. I think they're really cool. I'm a, I'm a lesbian, sue me. I love girl bands. So I loved this. I loved every part of it. I give it four and a half out of five stars. I really, really recommend it. The FF romance is delightful. The messy relationship between the three girls is excellent. I can't wait to read more by Rebecca Barrow. I can't wait. All right, moving on, we have my last poetry collection, and that is Homie by Danas Smith. I read this during the Queer Blackathon, and it is throwing off my white balance like you wouldn't believe. Okay. So Homie is a poetry collection about, again, blackness and queerness, but it is about what it means to be defined by race, by sexuality, by illness by diagnosis, and it's also very much about friendship. The power of friendship, who is your friend, and what happens when you lose a friend. And it broke me. It broke me. There are so many gorgeous, gorgeous bits of poetry in this collection. I think I highlighted something on just about every single page. And on top of that, it's accessible. It's something that I, as someone who's relatively new to poetry, was able to understand and be invested in and still recognize how much literary power there was in every word. I think that this is an incredibly relevant collection of poetry. It came out at the beginning of 2020 and has only gotten more relevant with time. And it is so sad, but it's also so good and so hopeful when it comes to describing friendships and this group of people that Danaz has collected that make them feel safe. It is unapologetically black and queer. It is about HIV and suicide and death, and it is essential. That's, that's what I have to say about it. And I gave it five out of five stars. Okay, we're into our top three, my top three books that I read in June. Next, I want to talk about Check, Please! Book two, Sticks and Scones by Ngozi Ukazu, the concluding part of Check, Please. I sobbed through the end of this book. <laughs> I've been reading Check, Please for so long and I can't believe that I'm done reading Check, Please. It's been over a month and it still doesn't feel real to me. So Check, Please follows a boy named Eric Biddle who has just moved from the South to go to this small Massachusetts university called Samwell University where he joins the men's hockey team, despite the fact that he has a severe fear of checking. And while he's there, he starts to fall for the brooding team Captain Jack. My god, he's Captain Jack. Why did it just occur to me? I... 
three and a half years. Three and a half years of reading Check, Please, and it's only just occurred to me. Oh my god. So this picks up where book one left off. Uh, it follows Biddy's third and fourth years at Samwell, and it is a perfect conclusion to the series. Uh, like I said, I've been reading this for so many years at this point. Um, I've been following live updates since... I think my first live update was somewhere like halfway through this collection. That was the first time I started reading it live as Ngozi would post it online. And to read the final, I left the last few updates unread so that I could read them all at once, just sitting down consuming the end of Check, Please, and I sobbed. I was an inconsolable mess reading the end of this, and it wasn't because it was sad, it was because it was so happy and such a perfect conclusion for this uplifting story about non-toxic masculinity and friendship and growing older and graduating college and... It's perfect. It's perfect. Oh my god. Like, I talk about Check, Please so often, and I've been worried for so long, like, what if the end doesn't live up to how much I've hyped everything about this series? What if I get to the end and I'm like, that wasn't the ending that I needed for Biddy, and I should have known after all this time to just trust Ngozi because she knew what she was doing, she did it perfectly. I love, I love these books. I love these comics. I gave this five out of five stars. I can't believe I'm done reading Check, Please. Second to last, we have Felix Ever After by Kaysen Callender. This is fun, we kind of match a little bit. Me and my yellow shirt. I don't know. <laughs> so Felix Ever After follows Felix, who is a trans guy, and he is attending this arts school and trying to get into an arts college. And eventually, one day, someone puts up this display in his school. It is full photos of Felix prior to his transition, as well as Felix's dead name hung up on the wall, even though no one has known his dead name. And so Felix is absolutely determined to catch the person who did this, and he starts catfishing the person he believes he is responsible, and then gets into a lot more than he planned. I've said this term many, many times over the course of this video, but this is about messy queerness and about queer identity evolving, it's about intricacies of micro and macro aggressions. Um, it's about Felix messing up and Felix making the correct decisions, and it's really good! <laughs> I was really liking this book. I was really sure that this was going to be like an easy four, four and a half star read. And then I read the last quarter, and it just blew me away how much this book was able to accomplish in the time that it did. There is so much rage and joy and discovery. There's Felix being inspired and creating art about himself, exploring more about his gender identity. Kaysen has written an absolutely brilliant book, and everyone on booktube has been talking about this. Please, please read it. This has a male-male romance that I think is to die for. It's brilliant. It's so, so good. There are so many ups and downs of this, but I think it's exactly the book that our community needed right now, and I'm so glad that it came out when it did. It just impacted me so much, and again, I sobbed through reading the end of this. I sobbed through all of these books. I'm a crier. I read books and I cry. Five out of five stars. And finally, the last book that I'm going to talk about, my favorite, favorite book that I read in the month of June, was Summer of Salt by Katrina Leno. I didn't think this was going to be my favorite book that I read in June, and then I read it, and... I can't believe that I hadn't read it until now. So this is set on a small island and it follows twin sisters, Georgina and Mary, who are just a little bit touched with magic, as is their mother. And on this small island, the most relevant thing about it is that there is this bird who appears every summer on the island and tourists come in to see this bird, but this year the bird isn't showing up. This is a weird book to describe. I would say it's a little bit... Gilmore Girls, a little bit practical magic. I would very much compare it to some of the other magical books that I've read. Um, all the Bad Apples, I would really, really compare it to All the Bad Apples. I think it also has some Sawkill Girl vibes, though it's not nearly as dark as Sawkill Girls. Like, this is, this is dark. Summer of Salt has some dark themes, but, like, the magic of it. These books, if you like these books, read this. I also really compare this to The Raven Cycle. 
like super strongly to the Raven Cycle. Um, so this has a queer main character. She is a lesbian and there is a FF romance. This is for people who love atmosphere. Like, this is such an atmospheric book. This magical small island with an inn and these sisters. It's so focused on these sisters and their mom and their relationship together. The main character also has a best friend who describes herself as, um, about as arrow ace as they come, which is delightful to me. <laughs> I was just so drawn in by this and it definitely made me cry and it definitely made me laugh. Georgina is such a sapphic disaster. She's, she's a disaster lesbian. She sees a girl and everything in her head goes out the window and like <laughs> a girl asks to hold her hand and she's like, she wants to hold my hand, which is so dramatic and so very gay. It's just emotional and beautiful. And I really, really loved it. And maybe I will find a way to talk about it better in the future. But for now, if you like the kind of sapphic fantasy books that I read, like the fabulism, you will like this, in my opinion. Five out of five stars. Okay, that is it. Those are the 17 books that I needed to talk about for this wrap up. The two that I read in May and the 15 that I read in June. What did you think of this wrap-up? What did you think of the books I covered? Were there any that you hadn't heard of? Are there any that I convinced you to read? Let me know down in the comments below. Plus, let me know what your favorite book was that you read in the month of June. I would love to chat with you more about the things that you've been reading. If you read some queer stuff during June, definitely let me know. Other than that, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you in another video very soon. Bye!